Hi everyone, it's module two, and I wanted to start this week by giving you a bit of some of the theory in online teaching, especially the, the different kinds of styles of designing online experiences. So this course you're in, ERL 590, is designed for everyone from that teacher who never really will have their students fully online, but wants to create these digital experiences in the classroom, say a first grade teacher with literacy or math stations, to that college instructor or uh, director for a nonprofit who wants to create fully online training or full online courses, just like we're doing right now. So I'm gonna cover kind of a full range um, as much as I can and give you some different things to think about along the way. Last week we talked about uh, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous learning, as we know, uh, for this course might be my saying class starts Tuesday at 4 o'clock. If you come on Wednesday at uh, 9 a.m., the class is over and you just missed it. Asynchronous doesn't really matter what time you come to these resources. Um, you can come moments after I post it or two days after I post it, and it's going to look and sound the same. So our course can have synchronous components. Uh, perhaps I may say office hours, Friday at 8 p.m., um, but they can have asynchronous moments like this video or almost all of the content that you're experiencing here. So that's kind of one key thing. One thing we do know, and uh, if you follow the blog Cult of Pedagogy, you'll hear Jennifer Gonzalez talk about this with quite a great bit of passion. During the pandemic, there were a number of schools that took a synchronous approach. You know, Zoom class started at 8 a.m. It was over at 8.45, and that was the end of the experience. Obviously, we had to model what was going on in the real world, and we couldn't suddenly have asynchronous classes taking place all over. But it's when we don't provide these opportunities for asynchronous learning, learning away from the teacher, that we lose some of the effectiveness of online learning. And I was really excited to see in, in nearly every post last week that what you're talking about creating are asynchronous components, things that can live online without you needing to be there to turn it on and turn it off. Because we know that that is far more effective for students to be able to access content either repeatedly or on a schedule that works for them or at that point of need. You know, we might be teaching uh, sentence combining or commas or something like that, or writing an introduction. Not everyone needs that, and some people need it multiple times. So that asynchronous route becomes important. Let's dive in and we'll talk um, about this course and some other options. Um, this course, the one you're taking now, ERL 590, uses what's called Agile Design. It is not pre-made. I didn't just open this up uh, June 23rd and say, hey, uh, this was 2020's course, now it's 2021, good luck and have fun. Um, there are some components, as I just explained to you, that are rebuilt. I'm not starting from scratch each and every year. There's no need to. If you, know, you don't write a book from, uh, from page one again, you might do revisions. So that's what's going on here. Concepts and guidelines exist, but how they come into play is very flexible. And that's really what we're doing now. You've heard me mention the pandemic several times. Uh, we'll talk about that and it's framed all of our experiences. So um, that's just one quick example of how this is agile design. It's flexible. Uh, components, experiences, the work, all varies up to a point. There are some common standards that you all need to take away from this course. Um, one thing that you should be able to take away from this course is an ability to teach an online course, even if that's not what you're doing right now, as well as the ability to actually um, 
teach your students using digital content that you create and providing them with opportunities to create some content of your own. So it's very flexible. But if you came to this course and said, hey, uh, I actually don't want to use anything digital at all. I'm a pure paper person. Let's go. Um, let's do some paper. Uh, it wouldn't work for you. So that's why it varies up to a point. It varies in terms of how we reach goals. The content, to some degree. Um, the approaches, quite a bit. You can't have a course with a um, elementary teacher and a high school AP teacher and have them doing exactly the same thing or creating the same thing. It just wouldn't make sense. And the tools and techniques vary because they change all the time. I count on you to come into this course and start um, exploring and finding new tools. Last year it was Padlet. It was a teacher who was using Padlet um, and I think something else, maybe notably or something like that. And uh, they were just pros at it. And um, suddenly everyone was using Padlets. Uh, some time ago it was Edmodo. And um, so that, that's where things can vary and, and, and different things can happen. Um, the course is very much in using agile design, um, taking a experiential as well as a bit of an experimental approach right there is no one right way to do things and to do this course you've got to be doing it you've got to be creating it and trying things and you may discover you spend you know three hours in a week and uh it didn't work like the website just was too complex and you weren't going to use it with kids and that's okay, because that's part of the design of this course. It's an opportunity to play. It's why in some years, when we were using Moodle for this course, um, we gave everyone access to a Moodle sandbox, because they could play with things and try things out. And that's how it works. There's a freedom. There's a willingness uh, for me to adjust on the fly. Um, hopefully a willingness for you to adjust. Um, but it is definitely about flowing uh, through the content with people and helping people fit things that work for them. You can't go rogue and you can't just say, hey, I'm not doing any of this. I'm going to uh, do something completely different. Um, but as on the other hand, you know, there isn't a step one, step two, step three pattern to this course. For me, uh, that works great because things change so much and people come to this course with such different needs. If you were all um, high school physics teachers from one school, you all had the same content to cover with generally about the same students um, and everything was similar, well, that freedom might not be so important and it might not really make a lot of sense. Um, but that's not the case. Um, the course is open, um, meaning, uh, meaning it's flexible that there's a bit of a freedom to, to shape things and create things as you see fit. There might be a week or a module that uh, you look at and say, you know what, my students will never do this. Instead, uh, they're going to do something we're not even covering, and I would love to do this. And a course like this allows that to happen. But it comes with a cost. Uh, for the instructor, it's a lot of work. It uh, requires a lot of flexibility. It might require creating new content on the fly in response to one student's request. Um, it might require shelving content that you've created ready to go. Um, it's, you know, the flexibility comes a bit with a cost, but it's definitely worth it. For students, that cost is uh, a need to sort of give up the, the need to have everything laid out, you know, do this, do that, do this. It, it doesn't quite work that way. There's got to be an understanding of, of what you're doing, how that fits in with the course, and how that meets or, or does not meet the goals of the course. So for some people, this is like the perfect, uh, the perfect style. For others, and for some institutions, um, it absolutely does not work. And we'll look at a few others that work a little better in some cases. So 
another design model is called communities of practice. And here's um, the kind of system where perhaps you're creating an online professional development community or course. Um, everyone has a buy-in. It's much more building participation or requiring participation than a strong instructional leader. It works in shared experiences. People are bound by a common interest. Very much more about sharing, sharing content, uh, using the expertise in the room rather than that uh, sage on the stage style lecture. Um, it can be ambiguous. You may not know what you're getting out of this until you get to the end of it if we're doing that kind of model. But uh, that's definitely what you might want in a professional development setting. Participation levels vary just like they would in a in-person session. You know, there might be someone who's who, who's really contributing a lot and helping bring a lot of things in, and might be someone else who's listening and taking notes, and that's how they learn best, and they're going to listen for the whole time and, and add something um, toward the end. And that's totally welcome in this style. For some purposes, it's ideal, as I said, professional development, uh, even a kind of a class where where you're, maybe it's a group of independent learners. Uh, this could work well for a writing center, maybe, depending on what you're doing. For others, um, if this was the model for this course, you may not leave getting a ton out of it because I wouldn't be doing this right now. We'd be all like, looking at different online courses and coming back with things. Pieces of this style work incredibly well, and I use pieces of this style all the time. Um, as a full style for instruction, maybe not so much. For collaboration, it's huge. Let's look at uh, another one. Competency-based. So I, right now, today's my last day. I just finished, I just took the final. I just finished a competency-based online course. It was run through the Berkeley College of Music. It was in audio recording. Uh, we had discussion forums. Um, we had weekly uh, recorded lectures uh, that were actually very responsive to students, but recorded lectures by the professor. We had content, and we had specific work that we had to do by a specific deadline. What I thought or wanted or, um, you know, my ideas about audio recording were pretty much irrelevant. Like the course was built before the instructor even took the job. He's not even delivering that content. Like the content is there. I just access it as I feel during the week. I do the assignment. It's the same assignment, the same lectures that have been given for uh, several years, probably at least. And uh, my interaction with the instructor is by getting feedback on my work. And when I do attend a live class, my opportunity to ask him questions that are related to his lecture. It worked incredibly well because uh, I learned a ton. Um, no one dominated, no one steered us off course, and I got what I paid for from the course, which is a whole lot of great content. Um, I could learn at my own pace. If I was too busy Monday through Friday and I wanted to crank all day Saturday, I could do that and be totally fine. There were discussions, but the discussions were purely a drop-off. You know, I had a thing to do. I posted it in the discussion. I didn't have to comment on anyone else's work. No one commented on mine. We were all good with that. That's not what we were there for. We weren't going to learn things, or very much, from each other. We might trade ideas, but that wasn't the focus. Um, the value was on the end task. You know, the work was due on Sunday. Uh, that was the grade, and, and that was, was it. There was really no option to, to change things around. If I wasn't so interested in uh, recording with a certain style microphone, I couldn't skip that section or ask for something else. It just wasn't there. Um, easy to repeat, like that instructor doesn't even have to teach it next semester, someone else can. And all they have to do is give feedback and uh, run the live 
class, which is pretty much here's how to do the homework. Um, and it's highly scalable. Uh, Berkeley College of Music, while it's a premier in-person music school, it has also built this incredible collection of online courses. My own son is uh, planning on becoming a student there in the fall. And um, it just works. It's also a money maker for them. Uh, I pay the 1500 per course, and or my school does, and uh, I take the course and I'm good to go. Um, so in that regard, it works really well. For high school students, um, it might work well um, if you have specific content that you need to deliver. You don't really care too much about the discussions or what they want to learn. It's pretty much like they're going to be signing up for this course and getting what they want. But it requires people to be motivated and to like really want the content that they are paying for. Um, otherwise, it's also the kind of course that, you know, like you don't have a stake. It's I'm buying into their ideas. They're not buying into mine. And you've got to be okay with that. So it is uh, uh, pay the money, get the knowledge, do the work, say thanks, and do the next one, sort of a style course. There's some other design learn models. We'll talk a little bit about this. Um, an online collaborative learning model. And this course uses, uh, uses this a fair amount, um, but probably we'd use it more if it was not the summer. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So it's similar to agile learning. It's a little less flexible. Um, discussion forums really lead to new knowledge. So discussion forums are highly valued. In this course this summer, they're not so much. And they're not so much not because your ideas are not important. They're huge. And I want every one of you to, to consider the expertise in the room. It's not me. It's all of you, right? I mean, I, I come to this with a strong background in this, but you folks are, are all like practicing educators. So you bring a lot to the table. Um, but you're going to be on vacation. Someone's on honeymoon. Uh, someone's going to go to the beach. And I don't want this to be a, you must post three times this week or you get a lower grade. So I want to use the discussion forums as a bit more of a drop off, you know, post your work here. I'll do a lot of commenting in the discussion forums. I hope you will as well. You'll certainly learn a lot by reading those comments and by seeing you know, other people's ideas. So it's a bit of a sharing thing. And there will be new knowledge there. But it's not quite as important as the individual work you're doing. Um, the learning directly supports the course goals. That's going on in our style of course as well. Uh, I'm thinking our style of course, agile learning, supports your goals in a probably equally strong way as the course goals. Knowledge in this style, collaborative learning, is built out of the course interactions. Again, because it's summer, because we're all on different schedules, I don't see that as such a key thing, and that's why we're using an agile learning style. If this was the school year and uh, we were doing maybe an online literacy institute, yeah, very definitely knowledge would come out of those course interactions in a huge way. In the online collaborative learning, there's a strong teacher role, but very active guidance within the group. Um, there's a lot of shaping going on from participants. So the teachers back a little bit, but still very active. Agile learning, um, the teacher is a little stronger, um, kind of a bit more of a leader in terms of here's, here's what's up this week, here's the path we're taking. Um, if we were collaborative learning, you folks would be shaping this a whole lot more for the group. Instead, you're shaping it for yourselves. And the last point, learners are actively shaping the results of the course. You are, you're just doing it for yourselves, not so much for the group as a whole. So I hope that's helpful. That's a little longer than I wanted it to be, but uh, you know, it's, uh, 
it's a course. <laughs> um, consider that sort of the lecture, lecture, and uh, hopefully that's helpful. But it does give you the background a bit in different styles of online learning. Again, I think it's important that whatever work you're doing uh, in this course as a student and in your own courses as a teacher, I think it's important that you come away from this, especially with an advanced degree, with the ability to apply for that online uh, job teaching an online course. Because um, you never know, you might make a, a bit of money and uh, really enjoy doing it as I do doing this. So that's a bit of the theory. See you in the course.